As you all know, there has been uh, several calls for uh, civil disobedience as well as a general strike on February the 11th. And uh, if you look at all the state-run newspapers, uh, they are all celebrating the failure of the general strike. Uh, they are all um, now accusing actually the AUC of being uh, plotters and uh, to be the source of uh, most of the troubles and spying happening here in this country. Forgetting the fact that uh, the biggest clients in this country are actually the generals of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces who receive $1.3 billion from the Americans every year in order to protect the security of the State of Israel, to protect stability here in the region, and in order to protect the continuous flow of oil uh, to the States and to the West at the end of the day. Um, what I want to talk about as briefly as possible is um, the labor movement at the moment and the potential uh, in these coming few days, if not the coming uh, few months. Um, while this revolution uh, has been described by, uh, by many actually as a Facebook revolution or youth revolution, I think most of the people here know better. You know that what happened in January 2011 was more or less the culmination of an accumulative process which took years of dissent, accumulating in the previous decade at least, in order to reach this explosion. An explosion which started on January 25th and by no means is over. Because no revolution around the world gets settled in 18 days or 18 months. It takes several years for the dust to settle, uh, during which we witness battles, uh, victories and defeats, ups and downs, ebbs and flows. The labor movement basically resurged in December 2006 when 3,000 female garment workers in Mahalla went on strike and they stormed the sections that had their male colleagues working in the spinning and weaving, chanting and basically they shamed them into action. Now since this strike wave started, most of the political scene or the political commentators as well as the activist community were divided into two camps. Uh, uh, were divided into two camps. Uh, and the kind, this kind of division still exists with us till today. Between those who regard the strike and the industrial actions as just an economic struggle over bread and butter issues, and uh, they are even describing the workers as being greedy, selfish, non-political, all what they care about is their own demands, and once they get those demands, they go back to work and they don't care really about the overall political scene. I mean, these are the kind of arguments that you hear today in the state-run press, but I want to assure you that these arguments actually go back way years ago. Now, my argument back then, together with those on the left here in Egypt, is that these strikes were political. They were not just economic. And they have the potential of even evolving into something even much more militant. If you are living in a country where there is an emergency law that bans the assembly of five people together, and then you get 27,000 workers going on strike, that's in effect you're breaking the emergency law. That's a political act. If workers in some factory get together in order to decide that they are going to protest or to go on strike, over 15 minute break, or over a three pound increase in the food allowance, knowing that outside their factory there will be state security police agents, there will be the central security forces, there will be the police force from the security directorate of the province, and that they might get kidnapped, they might get sacked, their families might get even tortured, and they still decide to go on the strike, that's a political decision. We are in a country where women are treated as second or third class citizens. Now, when you find in the strike wave that women are, play, are playing a central role in this strike wave, not just triggering it, but also playing a central role in it, and they are playing leading position in the strikes, isn't challenging gender relations uh, uh, force in the realm of politics? It does, of course. We are in a country where there is racism, sectarianism, and discrimination against Copts and against people from other religious minorities. Now, in any sector that had considerable Coptic presence, whenever the workers or the civil servants in that sector went on strike, the Copts took leading position in that strike wave. 
like, the, like in the case of the railways and like the case of the real estate tax collectors, for example, among many. I mean, isn't that politics? That's actually falls in the heart of politics. Moreover, the consciousness of the working class takes some time to evolve. I recall, for example, the so-called Cairo's Hyde Park scene, as it was described in February and March 2010. And that's when thousands and thousands of workers descended on the parliament and they besieged the parliament and they used to sleep on the pavement for weeks and sometimes for months, sitting in, demanding all sorts of demands related to their uh, factories and work conditions. Among those workers, there were many who were raising Mubarak's banners at the time. And I do recall many of, uh, fellow, uh, of my fellow activists in the movement, they were like demoralized, they were like disappointed. Why are the workers raising their demands, you know, to Mubarak at the end of the day? Don't they know that Mubarak are the one, is the one that's oppressing them, etc., etc. Now, let's take a specific example, and that's the Panta Flax and Oils Company, which is located in uh, uh, just like uh, 10 kilometers uh, south of Tampa. This was one of the flagship companies that we had here in Egypt, and it was privatized to a Saudi investor around six years ago. Now, the whole game of privatization, especially in the Nile Delta towns, is that you privatize a state-run factory, you more or less sabotage it, you sack most of the workers, until you uh, uh, make that factory completely decay, and then you sell the land as real estate. Real estate in the Nile Delta, is even much, much more expensive than here in Cairo. And this Saudi investor was no different from the other investors. First, he tried to sack all the women because women should not work. And uh, later, he started sacking, you know, I mean, the strike leaders and the workers in different uh, sectors. The workers went on strike. And they started a very strong strike in 2010. And they were carrying, at the time, banners that were saluting Hassan Begawur the head of the state-run uh, Egyptian Federation of Trade Unions, who's right now in Torah for his involvement in the camel, in the Battle of the Camel. Uh, they were raising banners uh, saluting Aisha al Hadi, Mubarak's uh, labor minister at the time. And uh, I remember the activist community were not that keen on supporting the strike because, I mean, look at them, they are not even like political, they are this, they are that, and they were making all sorts of accusations against the workers. Well, guess what? I mean, the workers, they had high hopes on these officials in the beginning. But after they were let down, I have photos of the same workers uh, uh, that I posted on my blog, of them like stepping on the banners that had Aisha Abdel Hadi and Hussein Begawar's uh, uh, photos. They were stepping on them and they were slagging them off. A month later, they descended on Cairo and they started a sit-in in Hussein Hagazi Street in front of the ministerial cabinet. Uh, headquarters, and they clashed with the central security forces on several occasions. Few months later, they were with us in Tahrir. They were with us in Tahrir. It took them some time for their consciousness to develop. Now, I am sure that many of you have heard uh, uh, these arguments that uh, people are not supporting the revolution anymore. Um, uh, look at us, you know, we mobilize or we call for a protest and like only a few thousands show up, not like a one million man and woman uh, protest like uh, was the case during the 18 days. And I'll probably try to sum up very quickly, I know that I've, uh, I've probably gone uh, too long. Um, number one, it wasn't us in Tahrir that toppled Mubarak, and I hate to break this news to you. It wasn't us in Tahrir. If we had just stayed in Tahrir, Mubarak could have stayed much, 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 much longer than that. If it wasn't for the mass strikes that broke out on the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th of February 2011, we would have been in a very, very bad shape. I do recall quite well Tuesday night when we were like all sitting in Tahrir with the other organizers and we were saying we are screwed, we don't know where to head. What, what's like the next step? I mean, we've held out in Tahrir, we defeated the police on the 28th of January, we defeated the thugs in the, camel of the, in the Battle of the Camel and the days uh, uh, that uh, followed it. We moved in with our occupation, we occupied part of the parliament, we occupied part of Maspiru, and the guy doesn't want to give up power yet. And we were all praying and we were all saying that, you know, if the working class does not step in, then we are screwed. 
and they didn't disappoint us. On the following day, the public transport workers issued a statement adopting completely the demands of the revolution, and they brought Cairo to hold, and the spillover started, and there were strikes basically everywhere. These strikes were part of the revolution, even when the workers were not explicitly talking about the revolution. If you had looked at the videos of the telecommunication workers, for example, going on strike, they were chanting a shirka to read Taghir al nizam which is like very similar to the slogan that we were chanting in Tahrir. When the bank employees went on a mass strike, uh, also in the last few days of the uprising, a strike which continued after the 11th of February, part of their demands was impeaching the CEOs and the directors of these banks who were completely, or like they were in the same bed with Gamal Mubarak, they were completely affiliated with the old regime. And they were chanting, Hoa Yemshi, Mosh Hanemshi, referring to the CEO of their bank. These strikes did not end with the 11th of February. Actually, the industrial actions witnessed during the month of February alone amounted to roughly 1,500 industrial action, which, is, which equals the total number of industrial actions in 2010. And these actions, although they were not organized in a centralized fashion, but they had a common denominator. Two demands unified all of these strikes. Number one is the demand for impeaching the corrupt managers. And most of these corrupt managers were part of the old regime. The, the workers were calling for purging their institutions from the Mubarak's loyalists. And the second demand was job security. Job security, I mean, as you all know, uh, uh, and because you also had a couple of strikes here on campus, Egyptians, they work for years, for years, without any sort of contracts or uh, job employment security. I'm 34 years old, I've been working as a journalist since the age of 23, and I swear to you, I've never had a contract in my life. And I've worked at some of the major, you know I mean, publications and institutions here. I've never had a contract, and I'm 34 years old. So imagine the case, you know, with other workers who are in a much, much, much less favorable position than, than me and what they face on, uh, in their daily lives. These strikes were not just in the public sector, they were also in the private sector. And for me, this embodies the heart of this revolution. Why? Let's take uh, the example of Manchet al Bakri Hospital. That's the doctors played a central role in the Tahrir doctors uh, movement that were uh, helping with the emergency relief uh, during the uprising. Now the workers and the doctors and the nurses, they went back to their hospital and they staged a series of industrial actions in February and in March until they forced the army into impeaching the CEO uh, or the director of the hospital and they held the elections where they elected their new boss and the ones who supervised those elections were the independent union of the public transport workers who brought Cairo to hold during the uprising. That's the kind of democracy from below that the labor movement is presenting. Now, in, in, in September and in October, and this was, if you remember, around the time of the embassy events on the 9th of September, and then Tantawi came out later to say that uh, uh, we're going to tighten the emergency law and uh, we're going to enforce it in a way that's, uh, 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 that, that's unseen before. The activist community called for a one million man and woman march or protest in Tahrir and only a few thousands showed up. And it was probably for that zillionth time that we heard, oh, the revolution is lost, you know, people do not like the revolution anymore, blah, 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 you know, we cannot mobilize. My problem is that your barometer for the progress or the regress of this revolution is how much can we mobilize in Tahrir, which is a wrong barometer for me in the end. Because during September and October alone, 750,000 Egyptian workers, three quarters of a million Egyptian workers and civil servants, they went on strike within the same month. And in effect, they are breaking the emergency law. In effect, they are breaking the anti-strike law that Hassan Sharaf's cabinet came out with. And at the same time, these people regard themselves that what they are doing is part of this revolution. But there is a schizophrenic attitude. I mean, I do remember, like, you know, I was with the oil workers in front of Hassan Sharaf's office back in May, and they were uh, protesting uh, uh, against the corrupt managers in their company who were tightly affiliated to the Suzanne Thabit uh, family. And 
they were holding rocks and banging on the metal uh, gate of uh, some sharaf in the presence of the military police that's trying to intimidate and harass them. And in the middle of the protest, the, 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 like the protest leader looked at me and he said, Boss, like we're not into demonstrations, we're coming here to protest. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, it's... I mean, it's, it's the same thing. But for him, Muzahrat means Tahrir means like, you know, I mean, like thugs maybe who can show up to. Uh, I mean, for him, this is like the media phenomena they are talking about. But he's here in order to fight for his rights. A general strike, I'm afraid, and I'll sum up with this, cannot be pulled together by a call on Facebook. Cannot be called for or cannot be pulled together by a call on Twitter and cannot be called for just by good intentions. The last two general strikes this country had witnessed was January 1977 and February 2011. And in those two cases, the general strike was spontaneous. This general strike either happened spontaneously, or if you're gonna call for a general strike on X day, like let's say the 11th of February, then you must be assured before it that you already have the organization on the ground that can mobilize for it. It's as simple as that. When they tell you Egypt is not Tunisia, they are actually right. There is only one, one major difference between us and the Tunisians. In the case of Tunisia, there was something called the Tahad Tunsil Show, which was like a federation of trade unions that was semi-independent. Its leadership was co-opted, but the body of that federation was quite well and sound. This meant that when there was a revolution and you can push the trade union bureaucracy into taking action, you can actually be assured that this action will be pulled together. Because al you know, you can you can know I have seven thousand teachers here, I have five thousand tourism workers there, I have six thousand students here. On paper you know them. So if you just call them up, they'll show up the next day. And there is an organization, an organization on the ground in the workplaces that's working and agitating and organizing on a daily basis. Here in Egypt, unfortunately, we do not have this organization. The general strike that happened in February 2011 happened spontaneously. There were parts, there were parts where the socialist movement or other left-wing factions did have presence on the ground. So we did agitate and we did push for industrial actions in these places and it managed uh, 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 to happen with success, but it's the domino effect of these actions that led to the general strike then. This time, you actually do not have the same situation as 2011. Secondly, what we were hoping for, I mean, in advance we knew that there wasn't going to be a general strike on that day, even when the Independent Federation of Trade Unions had uh, uh, expressed its support for this action. Why? <coughs> Kamal Abu Ita can tell you that he has 2 million workers in his independent federation of trade unions, which is true. But there is unevenness in this union. This is a new federation of trade unions that has just been established. Not all of these unions have managed to create roots in the ground yet. Some of those unions are militant. They were born in the midst of strikes and struggles. Others were just like a legal uh, kind of like struggle where they just collected signatures and that's it. But what I'm saying, and I'll finish up with that, is that we shouldn't give up hope. Number one, there are people who are working day and night on establishing this federation. And there are industrial struggles happening everywhere that we are trying to liaise between. Number two is that the labor forces and the trade unions are exponentially increasing from January up until today. We started this uprising with only three independent trade unions now you have more than 240 independent trade unions. But their ability to mobilize will take some time uh, for it to mature. And um, probably I'll sum up here, and uh, I'm glad that my colleague Rasha Azab has finally been let in by the AC security, <laughs> and maybe um, she can take the floor from here. Thank you. Regarding the independent trade unions, as I said, uh, we started this uprising with only three independent trade unions, the real estate tax collectors, the health technicians, uh, in addition to the pensioners' federation. Now, 
I've really lost accurate count of it, but it, it exceeds the 200 independent trade unions. We were only 90 independent trade unions um, as back as September uh, or August. So it's mushrooming everywhere. Uh, which trade unions among those that I think are quite militant and can play a central role in this uh, strike wave? Uh, definitely the public transport uh, union. Uh, these guys, I mean, played, okay. although they were announced officially in March, but the core of the trade union organizers have been active in the strikes from 2007 uh, onwards. Uh, definitely, it's, it's one of the most important uh, unions there. Uh, you add to it the real estate tax collectors union. Um, they don't have much economic weight, but they are good at mobilizing. And they are the ones who established the first independent trade union since 1957. They are the ones who started uh, this way uh, when they announced their uh, union in December 2008. Um, there are local independent unions that are mushrooming in some workplaces that I think also are quite important. Like for example, the Al-Ain uh, port uh, workers, who have already gone on strike. Um, and some of their strike leaders are actually, uh, have been involved quite well in the revolution uh, from the start. Uh, regarding uh, your question about leadership, I'm afraid you're asking for something impossible. Um, number one, what are we clear about in terms of our goals? Our goals haven't changed since January 2011. We won the downfall of the regime. This regime is militaristic. This regime, the military, has always been playing the central role in the backbone of this dictatorship since 1952. So when we say, you know, we want to bring uh, uh, scrap down, we actually mean that we want to bring the regime down. Uh, that's why we're saying no safe exit uh, for scrap. Uh, we, I mean me, Russia and others here in Egypt, uh, on the left mainly, we've been calling since February 12th to take the Tahrir to our factories, to take the Tahrir to our universities, to take the Tahrir to the workplaces, to take the Tahrir to our neighborhoods. We are quite clear about who's the enemy. I mean, you, you don't have to worry about that. Regarding leadership, you know, sometimes people would come to me on Twitter and say, uh, Hussein, why don't you now mobilize the workers for a general strike? Well, I mean, do you think if I can mobilize the workers for a general strike, yeah, and I'm waiting for you on Twitter to, to tell me, Hussein, please mobilize them. Why didn't I mobilize them a year ago? When somebody comes up to me and tells me, uh, Hussein, you know, uh, bring back the youth, you know, who are in Muhammad Ahmed Street. Well, do you think that I control them or that I have, I have enough roots even on the ground in order to call for something like that? Your, what you're suggesting, I mean, there is basically, oh, no, I don't know um, what you're suggesting, you know, is something very important. We don't need one leader, definitely. We need a form of a collective leadership. But this collective leadership, this collective leadership, which I totally agree that we need, is going to be collective leadership over whom? At the end of the day, if I don't have backing in the street, if I don't have roots in the ground, if I don't create for myself a power base, then at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether we get together and announce ourselves as the Revolutionary Youth Council or the Revolutionary you know, I mean, Command Council. There are initiatives on the ground that are happening everywhere, like Kazibun, like you know what the socialists are doing here and there, what Sikhon April is doing here and there, what the Socialist Alliance is doing here and there, what independent activists who do not belong to any party are doing here and there. What we're trying to do is to try to coordinate between those actions. But believe me, if we can provide leadership, we, we're not going to wait, you know, I mean, for, for a seminar at the AUC to tell us that we need leadership. We know that we need leadership. But I wish if it was that easy, you know, to create. What I'm saying is that no revolution is going to get settled in 18 days, nor in 18 months. We still have several years ahead of us. This is not because I'm someone who enjoys chaos and instability and the insecurity we're living in from day to another. But every one of you here is studying, you know, I mean, history of political science can know that no revolution in the world got settled in such a brief period of time. So it will take us struggles in order to establish this leadership. Thank you.